All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our talk, Cloud Foundry's new .NET capabilities. I'm William Martin. I'm Pivotal's product lead for Microsoft ecosystem, so .NET and Windows and Azure. I'm also the CFF project lead for Garden Windows and Bosch Windows. And I'm uh, Sean Neal. I'm a solutions architect with Pivotal. Uh, so do a lot of work with .NET and Cloud Foundry. Work with William a lot. <laughs> yes. So I uh, thought we'd review kind of the entire landscape of Cloud Foundry's Windows uh, capabilities, um, particularly oriented around .NET. And so that it really starts from this guiding principle that uh, Cloud Foundry is um, a standards bearer for cloud native practices and is really uniquely positioned uh, to provide an open platform for .NET and Windows. And so a few years ago, their Cloud Foundry, uh, the Cloud Foundry teams identified an opportunity to make Cloud Foundry that place where modern .NET practices could evolve. And so, so far we have three teams that contribute to that effort, Garden Windows under the Runtime PMC, Bosch Windows under the Bosch PMC, and Pivotal has a Kubernetes contributors team that contributes Windows support upstream into mainstream Kubernetes. So, but starting with Cloud Foundry application runtime, it really does ask a lot of .NET in a way. Um, cloud native .NET really isn't, hasn't really been a thing until the last couple of years. In fact, the ecosystem around Cloud Foundry is really around open technologies to start with, things like Node and Python and PHP and Go and so forth. And to say that .NET and Windows support can be injected into the Cloud Foundry ecosystem, I think says a lot about the state of .NET becoming more open, but also the ability for the technology to support both ecosystems. So, um, and, but the idea of supporting a bin deployable 12 factor application for .NET is really kind of a new concept, um, at least a new concept at the time. And, but the benefits of scale and stability of the platform are really tangible when you can achieve that state for a .NET application. And a lot of the time, a lot of the ways we look at this is to think about the state of an enterprise, for example, that has invested over the last one, two, or three decades in Windows and .NET technologies. And what ends up happening and what we find is that they, they end up with this kind of miscellany of technologies, everything from old .NET framework apps, you know, .NET 2.0 or .NET 3.5 and whatever, and a number of different versions of Windows Server. Uh, Windows 2008 is a big one this year since it's at its end of life of support. But you might end up with a portfolio that includes 2003 and 2012 R2 and some tight coupling between those apps and those servers. And then all these other technologies on the left. But on the right-hand side of the slide, um, it kind of represents the future, kind of represents everything that we're, that Cloud Foundry and the, and the open source ecosystem has been talking about for years. Like Microsoft created .NET Core, we keep talking about microservices, cloud native applications, Kubernetes is in this wave right now. And, but there's this real gap, this chasm between the ecosystem that's the reality that businesses and enterprises are facing and the future that's being marketed now and that we're moving towards in such a rapid pace. And so in the Cloud Foundry ecosystem, we really believe that um, Cloud Foundry application runtime and container runtime is the bridge to get businesses from that world they're in now to the future. And so, um, so this is what we had to do to get to the state that we're in now. Um, it started in late 2005 and 2006 with a team called Greenhouse, um, which um, was really the MVP of Cloud Foundry being able to enable CF push for uh, Windows applications and .NET apps. And this truly validated that .NET could run on the platform in this kind of 12-factor uh, state. And it also validated that developers love the experience. Um, this was Diego Windows release. It shipped as an MSI that you could run on a manually deployed Windows VM and effectively hook it up to a running Cloud Foundry instance and then CF push your apps by specifying a new runtime stack. 
And so while a great developer experience that Cloud Foundry is known for, it was a really terrible operator experience. And so in 2017, enter Bosch Windows. And this is really when Windows entered this realm of immutable infrastructure and infrastructure as code. Um, in, in enterprises, Windows typically deployed either bare metal or in a VM and tur quickly turns into a pet and then quickly turns into a snowflake. Um, and this is really a paradigm shift for managing Windows um, outside of a management infrastructure like Active Directory. So, Bosch managing Windows VMs, treating them like cattle, being able to destroy a Windows VM when it becomes unhealthy automatically and resurrect it. It's a totally new way of thinking about how to manage a fleet of Windows servers. And finally, a platform engineer could, could deploy it and operationalize it and automate that lifecycle in really fundamental ways. So this is where the Windows stem cells came about. Um, you could Bosch deploy Cloud Foundry with Windows um, Diego cells attached to them. And Greenhouse then split, split into uh, the Garden Windows team. Um, um, many of whose engineers are here in the audience today. Um, and um, <laughs> yes, and uh, under the runtime PMC. And we also created a Bosch, corollary Bosch Windows team under the Bosch PMC. Oh, and there's this bonus as well. Like now you can CF push with a build pack, which is pretty amazing. And so 2018, containers hit the scene. So while Windows 2016 really created the Windows container, it wasn't until 2018 until we really got to a state where we thought that the new runtime built on Windows containers was GA. So um, this is the creation of technology that's really analogous to what Linux looks like. And then finally, what we wanted to talk about today and what we're going to emphasize today is the, all the features and tactics that we've developed over the last year or a year and a half or so to really run Cloud Foundry in the enterprise and run it efficiently and well. And so all the highlights that you see in yellow there will be the kind of focus of this talk. And so this is a slide that just shows the kind of breadth of capabilities that uh, Cloud Foundry application runtime with Windows supports now. And the ones, some of these, um, actually the Garden and Bosch Windows teams have already presented in previous CF summits um, when they were created. Um, and some of them are new, like the SMB mounts and uh, support for trusted certificates. Uh, the, what we're going to talk about today are techniques and tactics that really make this real and really make this enterprise ready. And so, um, but that, but as with many things with Cloud Foundry, it really starts with the application itself. And so we'll start there. Yeah. So. My goal at this part is to really show you that a lot of .NET applications can run on Cloud Foundry pretty easily. And the, first of all, you have to step back and look at your portfolio of applications that you have. You know, it's a continuum from I have really modern .NET Core applications that I can run on Linux to all the way to the other side of this is not something I want to continue running and I want to divest on that, right? Maybe that's a, a good target for rewriting in .NET Core, but something that still provides you know, value to your enterprise. And there's kind of this middle area, right, where you have applications that with some modernization would be good targets, things that you're actively developing and continuing to provide business value that would be good targets for Cloud Foundry on Windows. Um, and then there's also some other ones that they're still providing value. Maybe you're not doing active development on them, um, but might be better targets for Kubernetes because they have or they have dependencies on certain drivers or other esoteric configurations that maybe don't fit well with Cloud Foundry. And so one of the first things you have to do when you figure out, hey, I have an application and I want to make this work really well on uh, Cloud Foundry on Windows is the, the 12-factor app, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, but specifically for .NET apps, there's three that I highlight here that are very important that you have to pay special attention to always. Because um, some of them you get out of the box with Cloud Foundry, and other ones uh, you get out of the box with .NET and IIS or Hostable Web Core. Um, but the dependencies being, I don't have an application that requires something to be pre-installed on my root FS. Uh, so anything that you have to, any dependencies the application have have to be bin deployable. So that's one of the biggest 
dependence or biggest requirements for a 12 factor app to be um, hostable on uh, Cloud Foundry. Configuration is something you always end up have to look at. At the bare minimum, you have to update it to work in the new environment. So updating connection strings and um, maybe even going a step further with Steel Toe and doing config server. Um, and then stateless processes, that's really specifically around um, session state management. Maybe instead of using the in-process session state manager, you change it out to use Redis or something distributed like SQL Server. There are lots of different types of .NET applications, so you're wondering, well, I have a Web Forms app or I have an MVC app. Does that work on Cloud Foundry? Yes, absolutely. So I would say, Web API and MVC applications are really prime targets to work on Cloud Foundry on Windows runtime. They don't really require a lot of changes most of the time because they tend to be more modern, less dependencies, uh, unit tests usually around them. Um, those are also possible candidates that you might want to actually modernize without a whole lot of rewriting to work on .NET Core and maybe target Linux with those. Web form apps, though, however, those are usually bigger monoliths without tests. Usually, they've been around for almost 20 years sometimes. Um, those are probably, with some slight modernization, good targets to run on Cloud Foundry on Windows versus having to um, and maybe use, like, strangle the monolith patterns with that and uh, rewrite parts of it as you go along in .NET Core. Uh, Windows services, uh, those don't work in Cloud Foundry, but with a little tiny bit of work, you can convert them to a console application and you can host those in Cloud Foundry using the binary build pack. There's some other ones like uh, COTS applications and you know, things that are stateful. Those might be better targets for uh, Kubernetes. But let's get a little deeper. So let's say you actually start and you start pushing your applications out. Like what does that look like? What things you actually have to do tactically? So CF logs works just like anything else. A Java app, .NET app, doesn't matter. You have CF logs available to you. However, you do have to make some changes probably to your application. So you need to make sure you're writing a standard out or standard error. And so a lot of times you're already using a logging framework like Log4Net or Siri Log. That means changing out the appenders to target the console or standard out so that the logs show up automatically in Cloud Foundry. Um, some other good things to do is make sure you have a global error handler. So if your application crashes, so you can find out why it's crashing. Um, and then a steel toe logging provider is a good way if you need to dynamically change uh, your logging. For instance, you might want to change it to run in debug mode instead of always running in debug, because I've heard that's a bad idea. A common uh, requirement for applications uh, tends to be Samba shares. It tends to be a whole suite of applications out there that seem like they do a lot of uh, passing files around and processing, kind of batch processing, ETL type processes. Uh, so just recently introduced Samba share support so that you can actually mount a Samba share from your container, your application instance. There's actually a few different ways to do that. Uh, one of them is straight up NetUse or PowerShell. Um, but typically you want to put whatever the mounting is in the profile.batch file that runs when you push the application to ensure it mounts it. Um, and another way to do that is using a steel toe library that will actually mount it and you can get the credentials from another party, like maybe CredHub or something. Now, if you were to run into problems, which I'm sure none of you ever have, but let's say you do run into problems with your application, uh, the typical features that you might use in IIS and whatnot also work in uh, Cloud Foundry. So you can turn on .NET tracing. You can configure the tracing profiler or to write out to the console. So that's useful, for instance, if you're using some of the system diagnostics tracing, uh, or if you're using libraries that have already been instrumented in the .NET framework. So for instance, like uh, making a web request, and you're like, well, why doesn't my application work properly when it makes a request to this API? You can turn up the trace profile and dump out and actually see the requests and responses and help diagnose issues. Um, obviously, the custom errors modes, like maybe your application just doesn't start at all. Go in the web config, turn custom errors mode off, and so you see the yellow screen of death. But only do that temporarily, don't do that in production. Uh, and then uh, steel mode, uh, Steeltoe has a management uh, set of endpoints that would really help you, um, and I recommend you try them out or at least look at them. They have like tracing, uh, request tracing, uh, health. They have some endpoints for getting thread dumps, keep dumps from your application, uh, and they also have metrics, so they'll actually emit some of like the garbage collection and other metrics directly to the firehose. Uh, but maybe you need to go a little further. So CFSSH. Uh, you can direct, yeah, that works now, and you can directly SSH into a container. 
Um, first thing you want to do is make sure you run PowerShell because command.com is not very powerful, let's be honest. Like that's why PowerShell exists. So start PowerShell up. You can use all the power that comes with that. Um, you could also, instead of directly SSHing in, you can also uh, do some port forwarding, which might be useful if you want to use the CFSH transport to connect your Visual Studio debugger to your application instances actually running in Cloud Foundry on Windows. And so some things you might do once you're in the container, for, in, for example, you can curl an endpoint or wget. Um, just that use basic parsing. Uh, you're going to probably need to remember to do that because um, if you don't remember that, you'll get some weird error about you need to accept some sort of, I don't know, some GUI needs to pop up somewhere on server core which doesn't exist because you're not running a GUI. And so that's what that's for. Test net connections, so there's no netcat or telnet installed by default. So test net connections away through PowerShell to validate, hey, I can connect to this port. So that's useful if there's firewalls in your way, things like that. Um, you can also view files through catting a file. You can actually see what's been deployed onto the actual application instance and view like, hey, what did my uh, continuous delivery system actually emit for my web config and what was actually deployed or did I see if nor ignore something that I shouldn't have? Great. I always knew that there was a reason why PowerShell was called PowerShell. Yeah, that's in the name. So we wanted to jump into a little bit about how uh, Windows works on uh, Cloud Foundry application runtime on CFAR. And this probably starts first with the version of Windows that we support on it. Uh, Windows Server 2012 R2 was the first version of Windows that we supported. This used a kind of pseudo containerization framework called IronFrame that was built around job objects and um, file system ACLs and, and user management. Uh, the, um, uh, the current runtime still supports this, but those of you who are running CFAR anywhere um, should realize that we have plans on retiring the Windows 2012 R2 stack by the end of this year. So the rest of this should be relevant to show you um, a little bit about what the future looks like for Windows support on CFAR. Windows Server 2016 introduced Windows containers as a technology. We didn't support this on CFAR um, for a couple of reasons. The networking service wasn't really mature yet. The container base image was four and a half gigabytes, which made the root file system like five and a half gigabytes, which was, which was pretty hefty and actually challenged some of the default settings for um, some of the blob stores inside Cloud Foundry. Um, but Microsoft started shipping uh, versions of Windows every six months, actually feature releases, this new channel they call the semi-annual channel releases, which comes along with your licensing for um, the long-term servicing channel, Windows 2016 or 2019, uh, assuming you have the right level of support purchased. So this is really what enabled Cloud Foundry to take off with a containerized runtime for Windows. So there are, there's support for Windows Server 1709 um, and then 1803, which shipped six months later, uh, around early May of 2018. And this really reduced the size of the container image to a really small level, and we were able to leverage more and more of the container features as they shipped. But finally, uh, Windows Server 2019, the next long-term servicing release that has a, a, a 10-year support policy from Microsoft finally shipped. This is um, the official Kubernetes supported release for Windows. It's um, effectively a more stable version of Windows include, like as far as the, um, the uh, container APIs are concerned. So, and then finally, we've just pushed support uh, in, into CFAR for Windows 2019. So that's gonna be largely what we're talking about uh, moving into the future. But if you're not familiar with CF deployment um, and how it treats Windows, it's pretty simple. You add an ops file and you can just like deploy Windows Diego cells right alongside the Linux Diego cells. When you CF push, you just say dash S Windows and that gets scheduled to, Diego schedules that to the Windows cells. It's all this, and the emphasis on some of these slides is really the fact that there's a ton of common infrastructure between the Linux side of the house and the Windows side of the house. We're not actually building all new things. We're just building the smallest that it takes to enable Cloud Foundry to um, push that application and run it in a container on a Diego cell. So you'll note some users in the past that the stack just says Windows. This is a new introduction. The stack is now currently called Windows 2016. So we'll be retiring that stack soon, but it really does exactly the same thing. So it's just uh, renaming the stack, but it doesn't do anything different. 
So this is a little bit behind the scenes of what this does. This is the same lifecycle that happens on Linux. Um, this describes in the lower left-hand corner uh, the CF push experience. It's one thing to note, you actually build your application in Visual Studio first before you push the application. CF push with the stack, and of course all of these command line arguments are supported in the manifest file. And then that with the build pack lifecycle creates a droplet that then schedules that in a genuine Windows server container. And, oh well, the lifecycle supports build packs. So there are a few build packs to be aware of when you're working with .NET and Windows apps. First is the HWC build pack, which is, stands for Hostable Web Core. That's effectively all of the framework that's inside IIS that handles web requests. So um, this is a much lighter weight framework for us than running full IIS. Um, but it, that's effectively the, the framework that we hook into with our little web server inside a container to run full .NET framework apps on Windows. There's a binary build pack for Windows as well. This is for running .NET Core applications on Windows cells. A lot of enterprises still have dependencies that can only be installed on Windows. I think IBM MQ is, is one that we've run into recently. So if you publish your application as a self-contained app um, and push it with the binary build pack, you'll be able to host that .NET Core build pack on, uh, .NET Core app on Windows. Um, and of course, supports binaries and console apps, as is the name. The .NET Core build pack that you find in the Cloud Foundry um, uh, build packs library is for running .NET Core apps for Linux. This is generally what we recommend for modernized greenfield apps um, on running on Cloud Foundry. But just recently, our teams have implemented multi-build pack support for the HWC build pack, which has enabled some APM vendors like New Relic and AppDynamics um, to build integrations with Cloud Foundry. So now a developer can push with the HWC build pack and the New Relic build pack, and that in automatically installs the agent inside the container when that, uh, when that app is scheduled, which is pretty cool. So if we dive a little bit deeper, like all the way down the stack, this is the anatomy of a Diego cell for Windows, and it looks surprisingly like the anatomy of a Linux Diego cell. And in fact, it's exactly the same, except right at the bottom of the Guardian stack, where instead of running RunC, we run an equivalent container plugin that the Garden Windows team authored called WinC, which calls into the same APIs that the Docker daemon calls into on Windows. So we don't run Docker, in, the D in Windows Diego cells, but we use the same integration shim and call into the same Windows APIs, the host container service and the host network service. So in effect, all of the work that Diego and Garden and Loggergator does and Bosch does for Linux also gets applied to the Windows cells, which is pretty darn cool as far as being an open platform for .NET and other um, non-.NETy things. Uh, this diagram that shows the anatomy of a running container on Windows. This is, there are a couple of things to, to note here. Uh, one is that it's a genuine Windows Server container. Another is that the base image the, uh, comes directly from Microsoft. So you won't find any Cloud Foundry repos that distribute that base image. Um, that always comes from a Microsoft repo. Another is the fact that this is OCI compliant. Another is the highlighted feature here that we'll talk a little bit about later, which is um, a new feature enabling a lot of enterprises to go to production, which is injecting the platform trusted certificates into the root file system in a way that maintains the security posture of the container. And finally, off to the right, to go back to that point about the uh, the base image coming from Microsoft. There are two releases that you'll see available. One is the online root file system, or rootfs, which when you deploy Cloud Foundry will automatically pull that container base image from the Microsoft repo and inject it into the, uh, into the root file system and then it'll sit on your Diego cell ready to use. There's also an offline root file system, um, which actually Pivotal ships in our commercial um, offering of uh, Windows support, uh, which um, enables you to run a command line command to manually pull that 
the container base image and then create that file system release manually. So the advantages of that are that you can do that in a pipeline or in your CI CD um, or whatever deployment mechanism that you use um, kind of outside of the platform if you're working in an air gapped environment. So, but uh, you can run Windows in an enterprise in production and we'll go through some of those troubleshooting details now. Yeah, so I guess my point will be that running Windows cells is not unlike running Linux cells. If you're com comfortable running Linux cells, you should be able to successfully run Windows cells in Cloud Foundry. So there are stem cells publicly available for the public IaaS's. You can build your own for if you're using vSphere or OpenStack. Um, there are, so the CF deployment has ops files for go ahead and deploying uh, Windows cells. If you want to pull those in, this is one of those ops files. Looks like that. You upload your stem cell, do your Bosch deploy, include your, your ops file. I'm going to fly through these. Uh, some common Bosch add-ons. So there are Bosch add-ons. Um, and you should be using some of these. For example, the Windows utilities release. For now, you should definitely be including the enable the Bosch SSH agent. Um, I think that's very important. The other ones, maybe not as important. The syslog release, that's as important too if you want to have your Bosch uh, job log show up and the firehose as, or as well as your event logs show up too. So those are good ones that you want to be aware of. Uh, the thing to also realize about Bosch add-ons in general is that make sure you're targeting the right OS and you're not trying to run one of these on your Linux cells and vice versa. So one of the new features that would uh, we alluded to here was trusted certificates, so that's a very new thing, and uh, some very smart people at Pivotal actually figured out a really novel way to actually get these injected into the system trust door. Uh, it was actually pretty neat. So it actually, what it does is it actually spins up a container, and then it uses this, uh, it applies this PowerShell certificate. So when you have a certificate, you actually need to have it uh, on disk and in the registry, uh, which requires an ele elevated administrator level uh, privileges to do that. So once that's run, so essentially the container's running, not as VCAP, but as an elevated user, it runs this diff exporter, which creates a new OCI layer, and then effectively uses the hydrator to create a new root FS on each of the, the cells. So at that point, that's baked into the root FS. So let's talk about cell troubleshooting a little bit. It's, if you're comfortable doing it on Linux, like I was saying, you should be able to do it on Windows just fine. So remote desktop is an option, I would say, Probably don't use that, but maybe use Bosch because we're here at Cloud Foundry Summit, right? Let's use Bosch for things. Not only should we use Bosch, it's, it's a better experience, honestly. It's going to be consistent between your Linux cells and your Windows cells. So it looks very similar to how you would SSH into a Linux cell. Deployment and then the cell, right? And then, oh, one other extra step, PowerShell, because you want to have a real shell once you get SSH'd in. Uh, you can do things like grab event logs. So this example grabs them from the system log, looks for error entries. Um, you can expand upon that and actually get the full message by index there. So that's actually taking one that I found that looked like it might be interesting and actually expanding out to see the full error message. Uh, you can also grep for errors or other strings within your log files. So select string is kind of effectively the equivalent there. Uh, so this would search that particular file uh, stall log for a particular pattern called error but you can also search through a bunch of log files. So here's a way to do that, very similar. And then it also pipes it into select path, which just says, here's all the files I have found this string in in the past, and then you can go dig into those further. And then you can also follow uh, tail logs. So example here, if we're following a log, uh, the wait command essentially sits there and waits and follows the log as it gets written to. And then tail says, just show me the last five. Uh, and then Editing text, though, is not something that you can do from the command prompt by default on Windows, so that's a little unfortunate. Um, ideally, all your changes are going to be in source control anyway, so you're not actively changing things on a cell. But in case you have to, a good way around that is maybe download nano, so you can just w get that and then run that and edit a file to just a single binary. Uh, again, we talked about test net connection again, because there's no netcat or telnet. All right. And so in the last minute, we're going to talk about the future of Windows on Cloud Foundry, and some of the more promising present. So remember this diagram before, that's kind of this decision tree that a customer might use to evaluate the technologies in their .NET and Windows portfolio? Well, the two boxes at the bottom are Linux and Windows VMs 
in CFAR and CFCR. So you might notice on the far right-hand side, CFCR has a Windows box. What does that mean? Uh, yes, indeed, you can deploy Kubernetes clusters using Cloud Foundry container runtime that have Windows workers in them. It's embedded into Kubo release and Kubo deployment. It deploys a Linux-based master with Windows uh, workers alongside, which effectively lets you author a Docker, um, Docker container based on Windows and then um, uh, kube control apply it to a Kubernetes cluster. So just released, uh, or just announced, I think like a week and a half ago that Kubernetes 1.14 has shipped with stable Windows support. So this is the next thing on the CFCR Windows team's backlog. Uh, it's right there in, on GitHub. You can deploy it in a similar way that you deploy CFAR with a set of ops files. This one is built just for um, the current Kubernetes release. I think it's 1.13.5. So there's a couple of extra ops files here. Um, the anatomy of a Windows container on CFCR, it's pretty much whatever you put in your Docker file, um, as opposed to something more opinionated like it is in CFAR. A couple of things to note are that there are a lot of Docker base images already available from Microsoft um, that include things like IIS, um, that run either on Windows Server Core, which is the big container image that contains the Win32 subsystem and um, is able to run full .NET framework, or Nano Server, which is like a 90 megabyte base image from Microsoft that just is designed to run Windows binaries or self-contained applications. So, and of course, the advantages of a Docker file, you can do anything you want. You can run things as container admin, you can configure things at will. Of course, that comes along with it, all the responsibility, so that's actually a disadvantage as well, is that you can do anything you want in a, in a Docker file. Um, but on our roadmap, cloud native build packs, that's been like all the rage today or um, at this Cloud Foundry Summit, definitely looking to contribute Windows support into that. Persistence on Bosch for Windows VMs, so to enable those persistent workloads on CFCR and Kubernetes um, deployed with Bosch. Irene Windows, this is now going to be the future of CFAR um, container scheduling. So we definitely want Windows to be part of that story. And then finally, Envoy and Istio routing on Windows. So the Garden Windows team um, has been contributing upstream to Envoy based on an original Microsoft fork there. And once that support gets fully accepted into the community and it's production ready, then that's the gateway to Istio. And so we can get some of that great weighted routing experience that UE demoed um, earlier at the keynote. So anyway, hopefully we've convinced you that we've been building the future here, of Windows on Cloud Foundry. This one? Yep. Sure. Go deploy Windows L's. <laughs> Any questions? Anything? Any, Any questions? comments or anything? Yeah, it'll be, uh, we'll publish it on the, on the website, on the Cloud Foundry Summit website, yeah. All right, thanks very much. Remember to reach out to us on Cloud Foundry Slack. You can find us in the Bosch um, uh, uh, channel with uh, at Bosch-Windows and in the Garden Windows channel on Cloud Foundry Slack. So thanks very much. Thank you.